Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. Today we begin a new module which is the law of evidence. Now this module will have three lectures in which we will cover the Indian Evidence Act. Now the mere fact that the Indian Evidence Act is being covered in three lectures should give you an idea that, that this is a fairly big sized act. It is not a substantive act. It does not define any offenses. It does not prescribe any punishment for, for the offenses, but it is a procedural act. It tells us what will be the procedure followed by different courts, what will be considered to be an evidence, what will not be considered to be an evidence and how will the court go about establishing whether or not something is true or not. So with that, we now look at the Indian Evidence Act. If you look at the preamble, it is a fairly short preamble. The Indian Evidence Act of 1872, Act Number 1 of 1872, 15th March 1872, whereas it is expedient to consolidate, define and amend the law of evidence, it is hereby enacted as follows. As small as that, it is expedient to consolidate. So before this act, there were different lemma through which uh, evidences were established. Now this act is trying to consolidate all of them. Define the law of evidence. So it defines what an evidence will be and what will not be an acceptable evidence and amend the law of evidence as it stood at that point of time. It is hereby enacted as follows. If we look at the arrangement of the sections, we find that it is a very large sized act. It is divided into three parts and 11 chapters. So the first part deals with relevancy of facts. Is a fact relevant or not? And it has two chapters, preliminary and of the relevancy of facts. The second part deals with proof. So here the chapters deal with the facts which need not be proved. So there are certain facts that are taken to be correct and they need not have to be proven. It talks about oral evidence. It talks about documentary evidence which is there in different documents of the exclusion of oral by documentary evidence. And part three deals with production and effect of evidence. How is an evidence produced in the court of law? What is the effect of that? So chapter seven deals with the burden of proof. Who has to prove whether something is an evidence or not? Chapter 8 deals with estoppel. Now estoppel is the principle which precludes a person from asserting something contrary to what is implied by a previous action or statement of that person or by a previous pertinent judicial determination. Meaning that in a court of law, you cannot go about saying that A is true and then later on you say A is false. No, you cannot do that. So estoppel stops you from doing that. If you have asserted something, if you have proven something in a court of law, then you have you will have to stand by it. You cannot go back on your statements. So chapter 8 deals with estoppel. Chapter 9 deals with witnesses. Chapter 10 deals with the examination of witnesses. So how are witnesses called? What will be the sequence? How are things going to be asked there to follow the principles of natural justice? And the last chapter deals with of improper admission and rejection of evidence. So let's begin with part one, relevancy of facts. The first chapter is preliminary. As always, the first section deals with title, extent and commencement. So the short title, this act may be called the Indian Evidence Act 1872. So this is the title of the act. Where does it extend? It extends to the whole of India 
and applies to all judicial proceedings in or before any court, including courts, courts martial, other than courts martial convened under the Army Act, the Naval Discipline Act, or the Navy or the Indian Navy Discipline Act of 1934, or the Air Force Act, but not to affidavits presented to any court or officer, nor to proceedings before an arbitrator. So we have seen before what the process of arbitration is. So Indian Evidence Act need not be followed there. There the, the uh, procedure is much more simpler. But more than that, what we can see is it roughly applies to all the judicial proceedings. Commencement, it shall come into force on the first day of September 1872. Now, in some of the acts, the date of commencement is left to the government or the date of commencement is left to the date of publication. So it might say that it will come into effect when it gets published or the central government may by notification determine the date of commencement. But in this particular act, it states it then and there that it will come into effect on this day. Section 2 has been repealed. Section 3 is the interpretation clause. So how do we interpret different words? So basically this is the definition clause. In this act, the following words and expressions are used in the following senses unless a contrary intention appears from the context. Quote, so when it says quote, it includes all judges and magistrates and all persons except arbitrators legally authorized to take evidence. So, if any judge or magistrate or any person is legally authorized to take evidence, then that person will take evidence based on this act and will be known as a court. The only exception is the arbitrators. Fact means and includes anything, state of things or relation of things capable of being perceived by the senses and any mental condition of which any person is conscious. So, all of these are facts. So fact can be anything that is capable of being perceived by the senses. So if you can see something, if you can hear something, if you can touch something, if you can taste something, if you can smell something, then that is a fact. So it is a fact that sugar is sweet. It is a fact that a rose has a pleasant smell. So anything capable of being perceived by the senses is fact state of things or relation of things. Similarly, any mental condition of which a person is conscious, that also is a fact. Now, because this act deals with a lot, a lot of procedural aspects, so it makes use of many examples. So you'll find examples and illustrations strewn throughout this act. And these examples make it clearer about what this act is trying to state because otherwise these topics become very dry. So for instance, here it says illustrations that there are certain objects arranged in a certain order in a certain place is a fact. So for example, if chairs are arranged in a certain order in a particular room, then we'll call it a fact. That a man heard or saw something is a fact because it was capable of being perceived through one of the senses and in this case the sense was that of hearing or seeing. That a man said certain words is a fact. That a man holds a certain opinion, has a certain intention, acts in good faith or fraudulently or uses a particular word in a particular sense or is or was at a specified time conscious of a particular sensation is a fact that a man has a certain reputation is a fact. So this is illustrating what the word fact means. Then the next term is relevant. One fact is said to be relevant to another when the one is connected with the other in any of the ways referred to in the provisions of this act relating to the relevancy of facts. So in a short while later, we'll look at what facts are relevant. And different sections say that, okay, this is relevant, this is not relevant. And when a section says that this thing is relevant, we will use the term relevancy for that. So this is what it is 
referring to relevant means it is connected in any of the ways referred to in the provisions of this act. Facts and issue means and includes any fact. So, means and include means that it, it is comprised of what is being said later on and it includes what is being said later on, meaning that it can also include something else as well. So, it means and includes any fact from which either by itself or in connection with other facts, the existence, non-existence, nature or extent of any right, liability or disability asserted or denied in any suit or proceeding necessarily follows. So, here again it becomes a bit tedious definition. So, let us look at the illustrations. Now, A is accused of the murder of B. So, in this case, what are the facts in issue? So, if A has been accused that he has murdered B, then the, the facts in issue are A caused B's death. So, that is a fact in issue. So, that will have to be proven in the court that yes, A has caused B's death. Then another fact in issue will be A intended to cause B's death. It was not an accident, it was an intended act. So, that again is a fact in issue, whether it was true or not. Then A had received grave and sudden provocation from B. That is also a fact in issue. Because if we can prove that A had received a grave and sudden provocation from B, because of which A acted in a way as to result in B's death, then we will be able to prove that A has caused the murder of B. So, this again is a fact in issue. Now, we have seen before in the context of the Indian Penal Code that there are certain general exceptions. And one of those general exceptions is the situation of unsoundness of mind. So, if A was having an unsound mind and if A did not know that what he is doing will result in the death of B, if he could not grasp it. So, in that case, A might be given a lenient punishment or A might not be held liable at all. Now, so in this particular case, this becomes a fact and issue whether at the time of doing the act, A was having an unsoundness of mind or not, whether he was capable of knowing the nature of his actions or not. So, all of these are facts and issue. Document means any matter expressed or described upon any substance by means of letters, figures or marks or by more than one of those means intended to be used or which may be used for the purpose of recording that matter. So, any of these things. Now, in this case, you will note that when we talk about document, it does not mean a paper because document can also be in media that, that are not paper. So, illustration, a writing is a document. Words printed, lithographed or photographed are documents. A map or a plan is a document. An inscription on a metal plate or a stone is a document and a caricature is a document. So, for example, if somebody is dying and while dying he has mentioned on a piece of rock or on the floor that such and such person has killed me. So, in that case, because that is a mark that is left for recording something, so that will be considered to be a document even though it is not a piece of paper. So, by defining these words in these manners, the Indian Evidence Act lets the court to accept that evidence as a document. Now, what is an evidence? Evidence means and includes all statements which the court permits or requires to be made before it by witnesses in relation to matters of fact under inquiry such statements are called oral evidence. So, anything that is stated, that is said in the court and all documents including electronic records produced for the inspection of the court and such documents are called documentary evidence. 
So both these comprise the evidence. So evidence can be oral evidence in the way of saying things or it can be documentary evidence. Proved. When is something said to be proved? A fact is said to be proved when after considering the matters before it, the court either believes it to exist or considers its existence so probable that a prudent man ought under the circumstances of the particular case to act upon the supposition that it exists. So in that case, we'll say that the fact has been proved. That is the court is believing that this matter exists. Disproved, a fact is said to be disproved when after considering the matters before it, the court either believes that it does not exist or considers its, no, its non-existence so probable that a prudent man ought under the circumstances of the particular case to act upon the supposition that it does not exist. And not proved, a fact is said not to be proved when it is neither proved nor disproved. So a fact can state in three different uh, ways. It can be a proved fact, it can be a disproved fact, or it can be a fact that is not proved. That is, it has neither been proved nor been disproved. India means the territory of India excluding the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, this portion has been modified with the Jammu and Kashmir Reorganization Act. The expressions certifying authority, electronic signature, electronic signature certificate and so on are uh, shall have the meanings respectively assigned to them in the ID Act of 2000. Then section 4 deals with these three words, may presume, shall presume and conclusive proof. So when something is said to be may presume, so the court may presume the fact. So it may either regard this that fact as proved until and unless it is disproved or may call for proof of it. So if the court may presume something, then the court may take it to be correct or it may ask for its proof. But if something is said to be shall presume, when it is directed by this act that the court shall presume a fact, it shall regard such fact as proved unless and until it is disproved. If the court shall presume something to be true, then the court will take it to be true until and unless it is disproved. Whereas if we say that the court may presume something, so in that case the court may take it to be true or it may ask for the proof of it. Conclusive proof, when one fact is declared by this act to be conclusive proof of another, the court shall on proof of the one fact regard the other as proved and shall not allow evidence to be given for the purpose of disproving it. So that is a conclusive proof. Chapter 2 deals with the relevancy of facts. Evidence may be given of facts in issue and relevant facts. So e evidence may be given of what? The facts in issue and the relevant facts. So for example, A is tried for the murder of B by beating him with a club with the intention of causing B's death. So there is a trial going on and A has been accused for the murder of B by beating him with a club and with the intention of causing B's death. So in this case, the evidence may be given of what? Of these many things. The facts and issue here become A is beating B with the club. So evidence can be given for this. A is causing B's death by such beating. So you will have to prove that A was beating B with the club and A resulted in B's death because of this beating and A had the intention to cause B's death. So this is what this section is saying. Evidence may be given of facts in issue and relevant facts. Evidence may be given in any suit or proceeding of the existence or non-existence of every fact in issue. So in this case, all of these are facts in issue and so the evidence may be given for each and every of these. And of such other facts as are here and after declared to be relevant and of no others. So in this case, in, uh, in this example, evidence 
may not be given of anything else. So, in this case, if somebody is trying to prove that A was wearing such and such thing or B was eating such and such thing, that is not a relevant fact. So, evidence may not be given of these things. If this is the accusation, then for all the facts in issue and all the relevant facts, evidence may be given but may not be given for anything else. Then section 6 deals with relevancy of facts forming part of the same transaction. Facts which though not in issue are so connected with a fact in issue as to form part of the same transaction, they become relevant whether they occurred at the same time and place or at different times and places. So, even though there are certain things that are not an issue, but they are so connected that they become part of the same transaction. So, in that case, they become relevant. So, A is accused of the murder of B by beating him. Whatever was said or done by A or B or the bystanders at the beating or so shortly before or after as to form a part of the transaction that becomes a relevant fact. Let us look at another example. The question is whether certain goods ordered from B were delivered to A. The goods were delivered to several intermediate persons successively. And in this case, each delivery becomes a relevant fact. So, B did not send the goods directly to A, but B sent it to X, X sent it to Y, Y sent it to Z and then Z sent it to A. So, in that case, each and every delivery becomes a relevant fact because it is a part of the same transaction of sending the goods from B to A. Section 7 says, facts which are the occasion, cause or effect of facts is an issue. Anything that is the occasion of the fact is the cause of the fact or the effect of the fact that becomes an issue. Now, for example, the question is whether A robbed B. The fact that shortly before the robbery, B went to a fair with money in his possession and that he showed it or mentioned the fact that he had it to third persons are relevant. Now, here the question is whether A has robbed B. Now, what was the occasion? B was having money with him. B went to a fair and showed a large number of people that he had the money. So, it is the occasion and it is the cause of the fact in issue. So, because A was able to see that B is having so much amount of money, so this prompted A to rob B and so it becomes a fact in issue and it becomes a relevant fact. So, facts which are the occasion, cause or effect immediate or otherwise of relevant facts or facts in issue or which constitute the state of things under which they happened or which afforded an opportunity for their occurrence or transaction, they are relevant. Another illustration is, the question is whether A poisoned B. The state of B's health before the symptoms ascribed to poison and the habits of B known to A which afforded an opportunity for the administration of poison are relevant facts. Then section 8 says motive, preparation and previous or subsequent conduct. Any fact is relevant which shows or constitutes a motive or preparation for any fact in issue or relevant fact. For example, A is tried for the murder of B the facts that A murdered C and B knew that A had murdered C and that B had tried to extort money from A by threatening to make this knowledge public are relevant. Why so? Because it is showing a motive, it is constituting a motive or preparation for any fact, an issue. So, it is giving the court an idea about why A murdered B. Because this is telling the court that A had already murdered C, B knew that A had murdered C 
and B had been trying to extort money from A by threatening to make this knowledge public. And because of this reason, this gave it a motive to A to murder B. And so it becomes a relevant fact. And so this will be proved in the court. Section 9, facts necessary to explain or introduce relevant facts. Facts necessary to explain or introduce a fact in issue or relevant fact or which support or rebut an inference suggested by a fact in issue or relevant fact or which establish the identity of anything or person whose identity is relevant or fix the time or place at which any fact in issue or relevant fact happened or which show the relation of parties by whom such fact was transacted are relevant in so far as they are necessary for the purpose. So there might be certain facts that are necessary to explain or introduce other relevant facts and they become relevant in so far as they are necessary for that purpose. So for example, the question is whether a given document is the will of A. So in this case, the state of A's property and of his family at the date of the alleged will may be relevant facts. So the question is whether a given document is a will of A. Now if it turns out that A has a huge amount of property versus A is penniless. So the state of his property becomes a relevant fact. Because if the person is penniless, then probably he would not have written a will at, in the first instance. Then the state of his family at the date of the alleged will, it becomes relevant because if it turns out that A was a happily married man with a wife and with two kids and then this document which has been, been purported to be the will of A it does not mention any of these people and it just mentions a third party and gives everything to the third party. So in this case, the state of his family becomes a relevant fact because A would not have given it to the third party just in a jiffy. Then section 10 says things said or done by conspirator in reference to common design. For example, Reasonable ground exists for believing that A has joined in a conspiracy to wage war against the government of India. So this is the matter that is being dealt with in the court. That A has joined in a conspiracy to wage war against the government of India. So in this case, the things that are said or done by the conspirator in reference to a common design will become relevant facts. So the facts that B procures arms in Europe for the purpose of the conspiracy, C collects money in Calcutta for a like project, D persuades persons to join the conspiracy in Bombay, E published writings advocating the object to in view at Agra and F transmitted from Delhi to G at Kabul the money which C collected at Calcutta and the contents of a letter written by H giving an account of the conspiracy are each relevant both to prove the existence of, a, of the conspiracy and to prove A's complicity in it. Because if there is a conspiracy to wage war against the government of India, so in this case all of these things become relevant. And although he may have been ignorant of all of them and although the persons by whom they were done were strangers to him and although they may have taken place before he joined the conspiracy or after he left it. Whether or not these things happened in his knowledge or whether or not A knew all these people, it is immaterial. But all of these facts become relevant because they are able to prove that there is a conspiracy to wage war against the government of India. So all of these become relevant. So what is happening here is things said or done by a conspirator in reference to a common design. So there was a common design to wage war against the government of India and there were things that were done by different conspirators in reference to the common design. So all of these become relevant. Section 11, when facts not otherwise relevant become relevant. Facts not otherwise relevant become relevant if they are inconsistent with any fact in issue or a relevant fact. 
or if by themselves or in connection with other facts they make the existence or non-existence of any fact in issue or relevant fact highly probable or improbable. So, in those cases facts that are not otherwise relevant they will become relevant. For example, the question is whether A committed a crime at Calcutta on a certain day. So, this is the question. Now, the fact that on that day A was at Lahore it becomes relevant because here the question is that A committed a crime at Calcutta. So, if A was not in Calcutta, if A was in Lahore, so in that case that becomes a relevant fact. But otherwise it would not have been a relevant fact because we would not have had to prove or disprove whether A is in Lahore or not. But because here the question is that A has committed the crime in Calcutta, so the mere fact that he was there in Lahore it becomes a relevant fact which was not otherwise relevant. The fact that near the time when the crime was committed, A was at a distance from the place where it was committed, which would render it highly improbable, though not impossible that he committed it, it becomes relevant. Then section 12 says, in suits for damages, facts tending to enable court to determine the amount, they become relevant. Only in suits for damages. So, there is a suit that is going on and the court has to, to decide what is the damage to be awarded. So, all the facts that are helping the court to determine the amount, they become relevant. Facts relevant when right or custom is in question, where the question is as to the existence of any right or, question or custom, the following facts are relevant. Any transaction by which the right or custom in question was created, claimed, modified, recognized, asserted or denied or which was inconsistent with its existence. So, all of these become relevant. And particular instances in which the right or custom was claimed, recognized or exercised or in which its exercise was disputed, asserted or departed from. So, for example, the question is whether A has a right to fishery. So, if there was any previous deed that conferred these, this right to A's ancestors, a mortgage of the fishery by A's father, a subsequent grant of the fishery by A's father, irreconcilable with the mortgage, particular instances in which A's father exercised the right or in which the exercise of the right was stopped by A's neighbor, all of these become relevant facts. Facts showing existence of state of mind or of body or bodily feeling, they become relevant. For example, A is accused of receiving stolen goods, knowing them to be stolen and it is proved that he was in possession of a particular stolen article. So, here the, the question that is being discussed is, A has been accused of receiving stolen goods, knowing them to be stolen. And it has already been proved that A was in possession of a particular stolen article. But then if you look at the IPC, the terms used there are receiving stolen goods, knowing them to be stolen. So, how do you prove that A knew that this stolen article is in fact a stolen article? So, the fact that at the same time he was in possession of many other stolen articles becomes relevant as tending to show that he knew each and all of the articles of which he was in possession to be stolen. So, in this particular case A did not just have one stolen article, but he had with him several different stolen articles. So, this fact becomes relevant because it is able to establish that A was habitually in the habit of collecting or getting stolen articles. So, he was in possession of this particular stolen good and he knew it to be stolen because he was habitually doing it. So, he cannot disprove that, okay, I did not know this. A person might be in possession of one stolen good but he cannot be in possession of 
several stolen goods at the same time. So, it makes it very probable that he was habitually dealing with stolen articles. So, this becomes relevant here. Then section 15, facts bearing on question whether act was accidental or intentional becomes relevant. When there is a question whether an act was accidental or intentional or done with a particular knowledge or intention, the fact that such act formed part of a series of similar occurrences in each of which the person doing the act was concerned is relevant. Illustration, A is accused of burning down his house in order to obtain money for which it is insured. So what is happening here is, A has a house which was insured and this house caught fire, it burned down and now the question before the court is whether A has burnt down his house himself in order to obtain money. So, the court wants to establish whether the burning of the house was accidental or whether A intentionally burnt it. So, in this case, what is a relevant fact? The fact that A lived in several houses successively, each of which he insured, in each of which a fire occurred and after each of which fires, A received payment from a different insurance office, they become relevant as tending to show that the fires were not accidental, they were intentional. So, all these facts become relevant facts. Section 16, existence of course of business when relevant. When there is a question whether a particular act was done, the existence of any course of business according to which it naturally would have been done is a relevant fact. So, for example, the question is whether a particular letter reached A. So, the question before the court is, did a particular letter reach A? Now, the fact that it was posted in due course, so this letter was posted to the post office and it was not returned through the dead letter office, they become relevant facts because they are helping the court know the existence of the course of business. So, naturally what would have happened is, if this letter did not reach A, it would have been returned back through the dead letter office and because this letter did not come back, which naturally would have happened if the letter did not reach A, so the court would presume that the letter actually reached A. Then it talks about admissions. An admission is a statement, oral or documentary, or contained in electronic form, which suggests any inference as to the fact in issue or relevant fact, and which is made by any of the persons and under the circumstances here and after mentioned. So, a person can admit to a crime. So, in that case, it can be a statement, it can be said, it can be oral or documentary uh, admission. So, it can be written down or it can be contained in electronic form and it suggests any inference as to the fact and issue or a relevant fact and which is made, made by one of the persons and under the circumstances mentioned here. Admission by party to proceeding or his agent. Statement made by a party to the proceeding or by an agent to such party whom the court regards under the circumstances of the case as expressly or impliedly authorized by him to make them our admissions. So, you can have uh, statements by a person who is interested in the subject matter, you can have statements by person from whom the interest is derived. Then we have admissions by persons whose position must be proved as against party to suit. In this case, A undertakes to collect rent for B. So, A has this business and he is undertake, he is a, a rent collector and he has undertaken to collect rent for this person B. Now, B sues A for not collecting rent due from C to B. So, there was a rent that was due from C to B and A should have collected it, but A did not collect it and so B is suing A. 
A denies that rent was due from C to B. A says that there was no such rent due. Now, a statement by C that he owed B rent is an admission and is a relevant fact as against A if A denies that C did owe rent to B. So, what is happening here is C had to pay B a rent, A did not collect it and A said that there was no such rent due. Now, C is saying that he in fact owed rent to B. So, in this case, this statement by C is an admission and is a relevant fact against A because A had said that there is no such rent due and the person about whom A is saying that, that there was no rent due is himself saying that no rent was due. So, this is an admission. Admissions by persons expressly referred to by party of Sue. So, if there is a person who is expressly referred to by the party uh, to the suit, then the statement by that person becomes an admission. The question is whether a horse sold by A to B is sound. So, A has sold a horse to B and A says go and ask C, C knows all about it. And if C gives a statement, then that statement becomes an admission because it is by a person expressly referred to by a party to the suit. So, A has expressly referred to C and so the statement of C becomes an admission. Proof of admissions against persons making them and by or on their behalf. Admissions are relevant and may be proved as against the person who makes them or his representative in interest, but they cannot be proved by or on behalf of the person who makes them or by his representative in interest except in the following cases. An admission may be proved by or on behalf of the person making it when it is of such nature that if the person making it were dead, it would be relevant as between third persons under section 32. So, in that case, it becomes relevant. An admission may be proved by or on behalf of the person making it when it consists of a statement of the existence of any state of mind or body relevant or an issue made at or about the time when such state of uh, mind or body existed and is accompanied by conduct rendering its falsehood improbable. And an admission may be proved by or on behalf of the person making it if it is relevant otherwise than as an admission. So, only in these three cases will we say that this admission is relevant. For example, the question between A and B is whether certain deed is or not forged. A affirms that it is genuine, but B says that this deed is a forced deed. A may prove a statement by B that the deed is genuine and B may prove a statement by A that the deed is forced. But A cannot prove a statement by himself that the deed is genuine nor can B prove a statement by himself that the deed is forced. So, what is happening here is that there are two persons to the suit. One is saying, A is saying that this deed is a genuine deed, it is not a forced deed and B is saying that this is a forced deed. Now, A can prove that B said contrary to what he is asserting here or B can prove that A said what he is contrary, uh, what is contrary to what he is asserting here. But A cannot prove something that he had said before. So, in this case, if A is saying that it is a genuine deed and in that case, he can say that B had said that the deed is genuine. So, that will be a uh, relevant uh, statement. But if A says that at a, a time before, I had said that it is a genuine deed, so that will not be admissible. Then section 22 says, when oral admissions as to contents of documents are relevant. Oral admissions as to the contents of a document are not relevant unless and until the party proposing to prove them 
shows that he is entitled to give secondary evidence of the contents of such document under the rules here and after contained or unless the genuineness of a document produced is in question. So, when there is a documentary evidence, then it has to be shown to the court. You cannot take oral admissions regarding what was written in the document. With the exception that if there is a question that this document was correct or whether it was a forced document. So, in that case, there can be oral admissions that are admissible, but not otherwise. When oral admission as to contents of electronic records are relevant, oral admissions as to the contents of electronic records are not relevant unless the genuineness of the electronic record produced is in question. So, even in the case of electronic records, oral admissions are not relevant except when the question is regarding the genuineness of the electronic record. So, if there is an electronic record, it has to be produced to the court. Similarly, in civil cases, no admission is relevant if it is made either upon an express condition that the evidence of it is not to be given or under circumstances from which the court can infer that the parties had agreed together that the evidence of it should not be given. Section 24 says that a confession made by an accused person is irrelevant to the proceeding if it appears that the confession was caused because of inducement, threat or promise. So, in that case, the admission becomes irrelevant. Section 25 says confession to police officer not to be proved. So, if somebody has been arrested by a police officer and makes a confession, so that confession will not be used against the person in the court of law because there is a big chance that the police officer would have pressurized the person to confess. And so, that confession will not be taken to be a relevant confession. Confession by accused while in custody of police not to be proved against him. How much of information received from accused may be proved? So, if a person has given an information because of which certain things have been discovered. So, A has given a statement while in police custody that I have stored the, uh, the item of crime at this location. I have stored my uh, knife at this location which was used in murder. And because of that, the police were able to go to that place and recover that knife. So, that portion might be used but not uh, a confession that I have murdered such and such person. Section 28 says confession made after removal of impression caused by inducement, threat or promise becomes relevant. So, if, some, uh, if somebody has given a statement in police custody, that is not relevant. But if the person is taken out of the police custody and the court takes his or her statement in an environment where there is no inducement, threat or promise. In that case, that confession will again become relevant. Confession otherwise relevant not to become irrelevant because of promise of secrecy, etc. Consideration of proved confession affecting person making it and others jointly under trial for the same offense. So, if A and B are jointly being tried for the murder of C, so there is a joint trial which says that A and B together murdered C and it is proved that A said B and I murdered C. So, in this case, the effect of this confession will be against B because A said that B and I murdered C and A and B are jointly being tried. But if there is no such joint trial, if A is being tried for the murder of C, and there is evidence to show that C was murdered by A and B and B said that A and I murdered C. So, in this case, this statement may not be taken into consideration by the court as against A because B is not being jointly tried. So, such statements become relevant only when there is a joint trial. Admissions not conclusive proof but may stop. 
meaning that admissions may not be conclusive proof, but if somebody has admitted to something, he or she may not move back from those statements later on. Statements by persons who cannot be called as witnesses, cases in which a statement of relevant fact by person who is dead or cannot be found is relevant. So, if there are statements by persons who are either dead or who, who, who cannot be found, they become relevant when it relates to the cause of death or is made in a course of business, in a routine course if it was made or if it is against the interest of maker, then it becomes relevant or if it gives opinion as to the public right or custom or matters of general interest, then it becomes relevant or if it relates to the existence of relationship or is made in will or deed relating to family affairs or in a document format relating to transaction mentioned in section 13 or is made by several persons and expresses feelings relevant to the matter in question. So, in these cases, the statements become relevant but not otherwise. Then section 33 deals with relevancy of certain evidence for proving in subsequent proceeding the truth of facts therein stated. What is the relevancy of certain evidence for proving in a subsequent proceeding the truth of facts therein stated? Then statements made under special circumstances. Entries of books of account become relevant. So, A has sued B for 1000 rupees and shows entries in his account books showing B to be indebted to him to this amount. So, in this case, the entries are relevant because they were made in a normal course of business in the book of account, but they are not sufficient. So, they are relevant because they are, uh, they are showing that yes, A had noted down that B was, B had taken this money, but it is not sufficient because A might have also noted down it fraudulently and so it is not sufficient without other evidence to prove the debt. Relevancy of entry in public record made in performance of duty is a relevant fact. Relevancy of statements in maps, charts and plans, they are relevant. Relevancy of statement as to fact of public nature contained in certain acts or notifications, they again are relevant fact. Relevancy of statements as to any law contained in law books, that again is a relevant statement. How much of a statement is to be proved? What evidence to be given when statement forms part of a conversation, document, electronic record, book or series of letters or papers? when any statement of which evidence is given forms part of a longer statement or of a conversation or part of an isolated document or is contained in a document which forms part of a book or is contained in part of electronic record or of a series uh, or of a connected series of letters or papers, evidence shall be given of so much and no more of the statement, conversation, document, electronic record, book or series of papers or letters as the court may consider necessary in that particular case as to the understanding of the nature and the effect of the statement and of the circumstances under which it was made. So, if it is a part of a very long conversation or document or a book or series, then everything does not have to be proven, only that particular portion that the court considers relevant. Judgment of courts of justice when relevant. Previous judgments relevant to bar a second suit or trial. So, a previous judgment, if it is, uh, if the, the case is whether a second suit or trial has to be done, then any previous judgment becomes relevant because it proves that, that this particular case has already been tried before. Relevancy of certain judgments in probate, etc. So, probate is basically proving whether a will is correct or not. So, a final judgment, order or decree of a competent court in the exercise of probate, matrimonial, admiralty or insolvency ju uh, jurisdiction, which confers upon or takes away from any person any legal character, 
or which declares any person to be entitled to such character or to be entitled to any specific thing not as against any specified person but absolutely is relevant when the existence of such legal character or the title of any such person or any such thing is relevant then relevancy and effect of judgment order or decree other than those mentioned in section 21 so the judgment order or decree other than those mentioned in section 41 are relevant if they relate to matters of a public nature relevant to the inquiry but such judgment order or decree are not conclusive proof of what they state so for example a is suing b for trespass on his land so a is saying that b entered into his land without permission and b is saying that there is a public right of way over the land but a is saying that there is no such public law of, uh, public uh, right of way so the existence of a decree in favor of the defendant that is b in a suit by a against c for the trespass on the same land in which C allays the existence of the same right or way is relevant but is not a conclusive proof that the right of way exists. So whenever there is a case if A is suing B so A is the plaintiff and B is the defendant but if there is another case in a suit by A against C so in this case C was a defendant and the case was in favor of C again for a very similar thing so that becomes relevant but it does not prove that the right of way exists judgments etc other than those mentioned in section 40 41 and 42 are irrelevant unless the existence of such judgment order or decree is a fact and issue or is relevant under some other provision of the act so any other judgment is irrelevant unless it is relating to a fact and issue fraud or collusion in obtaining judgment or incompetency of the court may be proved opinions of third persons can also become relevant if they are things like the opinion of experts or opinion of the examiner of the electronic evidence then there are certain facts bearing upon the opinion of experts so for example the question is whether A was poisoned by a certain poison. Now the fact that other persons who were poisoned by that poison exhibited certain symptoms which experts affirm or deny to be the symptoms of that poison becomes relevant. Opinion as to handwriting it can become relevant in certain cases. Opinion as to digital signature becomes relevant in certain cases opinion as to the existence of right or custom becomes uh, relevant to certain cases for example the right of villagers to a, a particular uh, of a particular village to use the water of a particular well is a general right and so it might be proven as a general custom or right opinion as to usage tenets etc becomes uh, relevant opinion as to relationship may become relevant so for example if there is a question whether a and b are married so the fact that they were usually received and treated by their friends as husband and wife it becomes a relevant fact Gr uh, grounds of opinion may become relevant in certain cases character can become relevant in certain cases in criminal cases previous good character becomes relevant and uh, previous bad character is not relevant except in reply so if somebody is has proven that i had a good character so the other party can disprove that and that becomes relevant but not otherwise character is affecting damages they become relevant and so on so basically the indian evidence act is trying to give us through several illustrations what are the facts in issue what is relevant what is not relevant to a case what can be proved what is not to be proved what is presumed to be correct or not and so on so we'll look at it in more detail later on so that's all for today thank you for your attention jai hind